I might do this. I don't like stand behind things. <laughs> anyway, maybe I'm too short. But thank you, Marsha, and thank you so much, uh, Gary, and the, the board of curators. I certainly I appreciate the opportunity to to have our meeting here. My goodness, and what a beautiful facility! I mean, we can have thousands come here. We can all get in and, and have a great visit. But I want to thank you guys for coming. This is um, there's a lot of things you could be doing on this nice spring morning, and for you to take time from your schedule to be here and to, to meet with me really means a lot. I just feel so honored to get to represent you and, and to serve you. Um, it, it is a real honor. And I've been there in D.C. now. You sent me for about a year. And uh, so we've been fighting the good fight up there, trying to try to bring some of um, the 4th District's common sense ideas and some of our heartland values to what they're doing in Washington. And we've got a few slides we wanted to show, just kind of highlighting some of the things I've been working on in the last year. But we want to spend most of the time here just visiting. And uh, I want to hear from you. I'm here to listen and learn. Uh, I think that you all are the experts on issues, and I need to hear your ideas and your, your thoughts to get some feedback. That will be very helpful to me when I go back to D.C. So, you know, so make sure I'm voting the way you want me to do and fighting for the right thing. So thank you for coming. Uh, what uh, I've had the honor to serve on both the Armed Services Committee and the Agriculture Committee. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm really glad about this assignment. So those are the two that I requested because I know they're priorities of the 4th District and they're the priorities um, of the League, too. I grew up on a farm and my husband and I farm today, and so I'm really glad I can be on the Agriculture Committee. There's only four people in, on that committee that have uh, actually live on a working farm anymore, and there's very few in Congress that have a direct understanding and background in agriculture. And so I feel very privileged to be there. In fact, I'm the only Missouri representative on the Ag Committee now. Uh, Congressman Blake Lukenmeyer and Congressman uh, Sam Graves used to be on the committee, but they moved on to other assignment. So even though I represent us on that committee, I feel like I actually kind of represent the entire state of Missouri agriculture watching out for us here in rural Missouri. Uh, the, Ag the Armed Services Committee is such a, an important committee, and I feel so privileged to be there, uh, not only representing and, and fighting for the men and women in uniform to make sure they have what they need, uh, but to keep our, our national security strong, but also to be there for the veterans. And I know there's several veterans here today, and I just wonder, would you mind raising your hand if, you're, if you served our country in the armed services? Let's give them a hand. Thank you so much for your service and how you continue to serve your country today uh, by participating in things in your local community. Uh, we're the land of the free uh, because we're the home of the brave and because of you all. So thank you for that. We spent, I spent a lot of time on the services committee. I was asked by the chairman to pick up a third subcommittee. So I'm actually on three subcommittees. I'm on readiness, I'm on military personnel, and I'm on um, uh, air and land. And so we are uh, have a lot of hearings during the week. There's a lot going on now in our defense, and I'd be happy to answer questions about uh, bottom line, they're trying to cut the defense a lot, and I believe we need to cut our federal budget, but I don't believe it should be on the backs of men and women in uniform. I think according to our Constitution, there's only a few things that the government and Congress should be doing, and one of them is to provide for the common defense. And uh, we're facing, the, uh, in the 2011 budget, a $78 million cut. The Budget Control Act last August that passed, or some people call the debt ceiling deal, which, by the way, I voted no on, but it did pass anyway. Uh, but that cut uh, $487 million over the next 10 years for defense. And it set up a super committee that was supposed to come up with $1.2 trillion in other cuts. And if they were unsuccessful, then there'd be an additional almost 500 billion as well. You remember, the super committee did fail. They weren't able to come up with that. So now we're facing something called sequestration come January, where they're gonna start cutting an additional 500 billion over 10 years out of defense. So that's over a trillion dollars in cuts. And it is, it is, it is gonna be devastating if that is allowed to continue. Uh, even Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta has said that we'll hollow out our forces 
So we are trying to restore funding. I've co-sponsored a bill that would restore the funding for the defense. And uh, we're passing budgets that realign and reprioritize the budget to make sure our defense has the dollars they need. But uh, we're still working on that. But I'd be happy to answer any questions about armed services. But I thought I covered just a few hot topics. You saw the debt ceiling clock when you came in. Isn't that sobering? Uh, amazing. Um, we are borrowing between four and six billion dollars a day as a country now, just to keep all the programs going that uh, are out there. And that's why we're in the trouble that we're in financially as a country. We're over fifteen trillion dollars in debt, and you can just see it continually running. So certainly, one of the hot topics is our uh, federal overspending. And this is the chart I showed you last year, if you were able to come to the town hall last year, but I thought it'd be good to go over it again. I thought it was one of the most eye-opening things when I first got to Washington, and I wanted to share it with you, showing where our money goes in the budget um, and the proportion of that. The red is what we call non-defense discretionary. Oh, who's pointing? Oh, isn't that cool? Did you see that? High tech here. We, we've got a pointer and everything. Okay, point again. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, very good. That's new. I'm sorry. I get excited about small things. I'm sorry. But there we go. Um, that is all of federal government, basically. Um, all of the departments Department of Labor, Energy, Education, Transportation, Health and Human Services, etc. The Congress's budget is in there. Foreign aid is in there. That is. Uh, most of what we as Congress talk about every year, if we're talking about cutting spending, it's in, in that area because we have authority over that and have to authorize it every year. The other one we authorize is defense. Uh, and so that shows how much. So you put those two together and those are basically what we control as a Congress. Everything else is what we call mandatory spending. And those are programs where Congress has enacted legislation years ago authorizing the program, and then it just automatically goes every year. And so that's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, other mandatory, and I'll come back to interest on that. The other mandatory is they just lumped other programs where Congress basically says that if you meet certain criteria, then you're entitled to X number of dollars. So that includes everything from Pell Grants for college students to farm subsidies for farmers to uh, unemployment benefits uh, to welfare programs, uh, food stamps. All of that is lumped into other uh, mandatory. Net interest is uh, kind of concerning to me because are interest rates low or high right now? They're low, right? So I'm concerned if interest rates go up, what that's going to do to that piece of the pie. I mean, it's just going to consume an even larger percentage of our budget and eat up other money that can't go other places. So that's something certainly to watch. But the sobering thing is, if you take the other mandatory railway, Social Security, all those programs, um, they, um, well, let's go to the next slide. I'll come back. Hold that thought. I asked the staff to put this together. Um, this is the same pie chart here, just broken down into a bar graph. So you have the same categories that are a little different colors. We haven't got that quite worked out. We're not that high tech, but we're trying. But you have Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, man other mandatory, national defense, other discretionary, and interest on the debt. The, this, the bar graph on the left shows the revenues. So you can compare, this is how much money came in, and then this is how much money went out last year. And you can compare them uh, line by line. So let's look at Social Security. That's how much came in in Social Security. I mean, I pay Social Security, everybody pays Social Security. This is how much went out. Now which is bigger, the in or the out? <laughs> the out. We passed a threshold last year for the first time in our history where there now is more money going out for Social Security than is coming in. And everyone anticipates that's the case and will be from here on out. There are 10,000 of us baby boomers joining Medicare and Social Security every day now in this country. And so there's not as many young people paying in. So last year for the first time, Social Security had to start calling in its IOUs that it's been um, investing in other government bonds and treasuries over the years 
and the general revenue is paying back into the Social Security Fund so they have the money to pay out. But that's expected to run out in about 2027, and so then we've got a real problem on our hands. Uh, so that's why people are talk, starting to talk about maybe we should do some reforms to Social Security to, to make sure down the road we don't run out of money. But anyway, Social Security. You see the Medicare went in, 180 million, billion, and then uh, more went out. They came in. That has been the case for quite a while. Uh, and that's part of the reason we have a deficit we do. In fact, the average uh, United States couple, American couple, pays in about $110,000 over their lifetime into Medicare, but they receive about $330,000 in benefits. So that's part of the reason that we've got a shortfall there, uh, you know, and, and the problem, uh, something we need to deal with. Want to ask a question right now? Sure. that have been paid into Social Security. It depends on the lot that they sell, uh, whether you know that day they get 4% on this chunk, maybe the next day they get 3%, maybe 6%, I don't know. I mean, there's, it's a whole you know, combination of different investments that, for years. Yeah. She said there's people that die in Social Security they don't pay out. Uh, well, you know, the beneficiaries get some of that sometimes too, but um, there is there is more money going out than, than coming in, and there will be for quite a while. So, but the money is there. You know, people have it. I don't think the microphones work, Steve. I can hear, but I don't think they can hear. One, one, come on. Try again. Sorry. I don't use there, but now we have the borrow money to pay things. So how do they? Yeah, it, it is a problem. The federal, you want to know how the, the government is going to pay its Social Security back, and right now they just keep borrowing and to pay Social Security. So it's not a good, uh, not a good system overall that we've got going here, and uh, we need to address it. Yes. Has the Congress tapped into Social Security income? He says, hasn't Social Security? A little behind, Steve. A little quicker. <laughs> Um, has it, he says, has a Congress tapped into it? It depends on how you look at it. Uh, Social Security has had excess funds over until last year. So they have allowed the excess to be invested to get interest. And the investment has been Treasury, the government, Treasury. So whether you look at it, it's, you know, it's like a CD. They put it out. Uh, the government, they has bought the Social Security, the Treasury, and has used that money, but then it owes it. That's where they give them an IOU, just like in a CD. You take your money to your bank, they take it, and then they give you promise to give it back with interest. And so that's what's happened. So whether you call it the government has borrowed their money or the Social Security has invested in Treasury bonds, it's the same thing. But the government has had taken the extra, He's used it for other things, but given him an IOU, he says we owe it back. And, and uh, so now they're starting to cash in their IOUs. And, and, but let's move on to the other and then come back later for questions. Those are good points. Okay, so we have Social Security, we have Medicare, um, and we have income tax. Oh boy, April 15th, right around the corner. Aren't we excited? But anyway, that's how much money came in in income tax that we paid in last year. Uh, then we have the corporate tax. Which, by the way, now after April 1st of this year, as of Sunday, America now has the highest corporate tax rate in the world. We have that distinction. We were number two, but Japan lowered their corporate tax rate, as has most other uh, developed nations over the last few years to be competitive. So now we're number one, 35% tax rate for corporations. Other and excise tax. So you can see um, how much was borrowed, but if you go across there, the, thing, the point I wanted to make is people uh, have given great suggestions on how to cut spending. And I had great ideas too, but it's, I don't think a lot of people realize the seriousness of it. For instance, people have said, well, why don't you just get rid of foreign aid, you know, then we'll balance the budget. Or let's shut down the Department of Education or Energy or 
whatever. It, it just bounce the budget, or some people say, well, let's just quit paying Congress, you know, let's just that'll bounce the budget, or you know, you get these great ideas. But the point is, we could cut all of Washington, the other discretionary category, uh, yeah, all the departments, all of Congress, we could cut all of it. We could mothball it. I was waiting for a round of applause. Usually I get round of applause when I say that. People are like, yeah, let's shut down Washington. Well, anyway, we could shut down Washington, all of it, and we could not fund defense. We could say, okay, we're not going to have any defense. And look, we still would not balance the budget. It is that bad. <laughs> so we, it did take us uh, overnight. We haven't gotten here overnight, and it's not a Republican problem. It's not a Democrat problem, really. I mean, Congresses at both stripes, and presidents at both stripes have been spending way too much money for too long, and that's why we are today. So we're not going to be able to turn this around overnight either, but we need to change the direction and start spending less, and on the other side, get our economy growing, get more revenue coming in on the other side to balance our budget. So we borrowed money. One of the concerns with borrowing so much money, not only have $15 trillion debt, but 49% of our debt is owned by foreign countries. And of that, this is a slide showing where that is, 29% of our foreign debt is to China. And being on the Armed Services Committee, I can tell you, I have a lot of concerns about China. They're actually building up their military on the money that we're, the interest rate we're spending, uh, giving up. Uh, it's very concerning. Yes, sir. Uh. Why did Mike Lee talk to you? I can't hear it, Steve. No. Is the microphone working? Yes. Yes, it's one, too. Okay, just talk, talk it, sir. Thank can you hear me now? I can. Thank you. It's an honor to talk to you. Uh, my concern, my concern is China. We're buying military parts for a military from China. We're buying military parts that do not work. We have closed factories in this country, and that's who, one of the big companies that we're buying. We're a country that we're buying. We're going to keep fighting. And we're buying the stuff, we're putting it in planes, we're putting it in our material, and it does not work. And they are laughing at us. Look, there are a lot of people in this country that are getting fed up with this. I mean, fed up, please. Right. And something had better be done. I'm not threatening anybody. But I'm saying that something, I, I know, I follow this, and I know, I know what, I believe I know what I'm talking about. There is a line in this country. And I'm on one side of that line, a lot of people are, there are people that are on this. I don't know what's going to happen, but if things don't change, it's not going to be good. It's going to be bad. I really believe. Great. Excellent. Extra point. You're, you're spot on. I, I joined the, the name of the caucus is China Caucus, which I wish we could change, change the name, but basically it's a Watch China Caucus. It's a, it's a bunch of us who are concerned about China, and on a regular basis we get reports and watching what they're doing. And I am concerned they are shipping all the, I'm concerned about the microchips, that they are in many, many of the things that we own. And some of those are embedded, I believe, with, with detection capabilities or tracking capabilities, things that we don't know. I, I read a report the other day talking about how China is the number one spy network in the world. And I thought, we need to have a new uh, 007 James Bond movie, you know, with China's the bad guys as the spies, because it really is true. They, those movies always portray uh, Russia or something, but China has the largest spy network. They're stealing our intelligence from our co corporations. The article talked about has the largest industrial um, uh, espionage and uh, stealing uh, theft. In, in history, and yet how many people are talking about it, how they're accessing our intellectual property of our corporations, and it's very concerning. Just want you to know, it's supposed to be illegal. Uh, you're supposed to use American products in our military equipment, but I'm not sure that's always the case, and so I am looking into that as well, with your concern, to make sure that they're not using China microchips 
in our planes or in our tanks or anything else. So I want to make sure that doesn't happen. So I will follow up on that because that is a concern I have as well. So China is very concerning. Yes, Scott. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> He's not working. <laughs> well, see, I was working for a variety of products here today. Well, the company, uh, about five years ago, uh, took a we lost a lot of jobs here today in all of the reserves because the company came now, they're sending their products to Mother Hill, Walmart, and other places to find them. And one of them is private, and it's not private, it's coming from China. And we, I don't know if people know this, but we have a lot of companies that are sent over there. Steel workers, air dogs that are over here from China, a lot of our uh, rubber is coming from China, all the best coming from China. And people wonder why we don't have American jobs because we all been over there. Yeah, great point, Guy. And it is heartbreaking when to see American companies leave and go go to China. Uh, what I think we can do is get those companies back. And we have to look at why did they why did they go? And part of it is what Washington has been doing: the overregulation of companies that are just making their life miserable. Plus the high taxation, we already talked about the poor, we have the highest corporate tax rate here, uh, the overregulation, plus the energy costs are so much more here because of all the EPA and what they're doing. Uh, plus now with this health care mandate coming out, that's increasing the health care costs. And you don't have these problems in other countries, and so they're able to woo our corporations away. And so that's one reason I've been trying to push back on these things to make it more of a business friendly environment here in America, get those companies to come back here. We need to reduce our corporate tax rate. We need to reduce these crazy regulations that are just ludicrous and uh, forcing them overseas. We need to repeal uh, Obamacare, and I voted for that 24 times in different capacities. We, we need to you know, help all of these environments uh, to make a friendly business environment so they'll come back. Uh, because it is wrong. We don't want all our companies going to China. Okay, why can't you guys have Congress power? Why can't you stop the trade? That's where it goes. We sell our numbers to trade stuff in our country. Okay, why can't we stop the companies that leave our country over there, leave our taking care of each other? Okay, this is what we're going to do. Okay, if we're if you can't, you can't sell them back. Stop them from setting up buy their product and coming to the country. And so that way you can still rate me like blackmail. Okay, if you're not going to, you know, like if you leave our country and sell them come back and trade for us and sell them here. Right. Why stop buying? Right. Could you hear his comments in the back? Uh, I think he, he's, he was saying how come to have the companies that leave here and stop the trade and stop them from being able to sell back here. The, the reason is, uh, I looked into that some of this with some people, is that it's more complicated than that in that it, it can start a trade war. And we've had some of that, some with China, uh, and I believe it was on their steel. We put a tariff or something on their steel. Well, they stopped buying uh, American pork. And you know they retaliate. They say, "Well, fine. You won't, you're going to put a tariff or stop our products, then we're not going to buy your products." And so here our ad guys were dying uh, because they got that cut off. So China is really good at that, and they have to be, you know, very strategic in how you do that because we don't want a trade war. Uh, so I think the ideal way is to just make it more business friendly for companies to stay here, so they'll want to stay here and they won't leave in the in the first place. Um, yes. Surely, you know, I mean, one thing. I don't. The way I understood the way uh, the way that uh, Social Security was getting away from us was because when they started having the rockets and all that stuff, uh, and some of that Social Security was borrowed and went on the moon and some of that stuff in the uh, rocket ships and stuff when they started doing that. Yeah, I don't think there's been any specific. It's just been a matter of uh, investing. So the other option would have been the Social Security 
made all your money go there and you have extra and it just sit there. That's what I'm getting. The point was that I was thinking it would still be there if they would if they would let them up. Well, okay. I mean, it is still there in a way. Uh, you know, there's just just like your CD, you take it to the bank and they invest it and, and it's still there. You've got the paper, it's there. So you don't have to worry about it's not there. The problem is there's ten thousand baby boomers joining today, Social Security. That's the issue. And there's there's more of us, and I'm a baby boomer too, I'm not on Social Security yet, but we'll get there, uh, hopefully. <laughs> but yeah, there's more of us, uh, so people drawing out and now paying in. And so started working and they started paying in. So I don't know. I am not to stay here all day. I might argue the situation. I just, okay, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. But anyway, let's move on. I've mean, got to try. I've got a few more slides and then we'll open up some more things. Oh, back to that one. I wanted to just point out, and we kind of uh, we want to beat a dead horse, but the problem with China, we are paying them so much interest on the amount of money we owe them that they could buy three Joint Strike Fighters a day, I mean a week, with our money and still have $50 million left over. And we know that they are building up their military, they're building 14 nuclear subs right now, we're building one. Last year they unveiled their version of the stealth aircraft uh, plane. And they also announced their 1,500 mile long range aircraft carrier busting bomb. Uh, so it's, it's concerning, and they're doing that a lot with our money. So if we didn't have any reason to get out of debt before, I think that China uh, is an important reason for us to uh, balance our budget and to get back to uh, paying off our debt. So, along that lines, I've been working for a balanced budget. It's an amazing concept. <laughs> you do it at home, uh, businesses do it, farms do it, but Washington can't seem to do it. When I was a state representative for six years, we had to do it because thankfully, Missouri in the Constitution has a balanced budget requirement. So every year, uh, whether it's uh, Representative Cox or, or Senator Parson, they go down to Jeff City and they have to see how much money's coming in, and they have to balance the budget with it. And it's forced them to make some tough, it's been tough the last few years. They've had to make some tough decisions. But because of the tough decisions and having a balanced budget, Missouri is in the black. And it's one of the few states in the nation that has a AAA bond rating. It's good. Now you know what happens at the federal level last year. What happened to our bond rating? Yeah, you know, our credit rating went down because we have so much debt. So we put forth a balanced budget amendment um, to pass. You have to have two-thirds of the House and the Senate to pass an amendment to the Constitution, and then it goes out to the states, and three-fourths of the states have to ratify. We came five votes short of getting two-thirds in the House. So I was really disappointed in that. Uh, I think we're going to come back and we're going to keep trying that because it's the right thing to do. The second thing we've done is to pass a budget that on its own, on our own, uh, it, it balances. There's two versions. This is one last week that passed. It's going over the Senate. And it balances in about 2050. And then from then on, it'll start cutting uh, uh, the debt, uh, paying off the debt. Um, there was another version that was more aggressive. And, um, ooh, that was fancy. It's, oh, sorry, that's new. Like I said, I'm impressed with technology. But it balances in five years, and I voted for that too. Uh, it didn't pass, but we feel like it's important to balance the budget and to start getting us on the path that we start paying off our debt. We've got to do it. We don't want to go bankrupt as a country, and that's where we're headed if we don't do anything. The current path is the yellow, I mean, excuse me, the red line there, and it's, it's unsustainable. We just can't keep spending the amount of money that we are. Yes, sir. Uh, the current administration has not presented a budget in three years. Well, one, I guess, one more than Ninety-nine percent of the people voted against anything he's put put up there. Is it? Right. Is it? Uh, Ryan presented a budget which is I thought it was a budget. But we're not going to do a darn thing with getting anything passed until we get control of the Senate. That's a fact. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're you're right. It is very this budget has been the whole thing has been very frustrating to me because you're right, it's been over three years since the Senate has passed a budget. We passed a budget in the House, we sent it over to the Senate, and uh, Harry Reid, the leader there, said, We're not gonna vote on that. And I have to admit, I was shocked, maybe I'm just a naive farm girl from Archie. I'm just one of you, you sent me there and um, but to see people just ignore the Constitution has been a little shocking to me, to be frank. It really has. Because when I was a state representative, I mean, we had all kinds of opinions and differing agreements, uh, uh, differing opinions on the budget and what we should spend money on or not. But we followed the Constitution. The House would come up with a version and pass it. The Senate would pass a version. Then it would go to a conference committee and we'd hammer out our differences and come back. And, you know, we would get that budget done by the second Friday in May because our Constitution says to. And we would stay there through the night, sometimes that last week, getting the job done. And we would. So I kind of thought we might do that in Washington. <laughs> and it was just kind of amazing to me when we passed the budget when my colleagues last summer said, well, you know we're going to have to pass a continued resolution in the year because the Senate's not going to pass the budget. I said, what? You've got to be kidding me. But anyway, so we're trying the best we can, but we need to have more people in Washington who believe in following the Constitution and passing a budget. Yeah, it is uh, frustrating. Yes, sir. I can't uh, you know, hear you, though. Really, oh, is it not working? I don't think so. I want to thank you for this, incidentally. You know, balanced budgets are an endangered species. In 2000, we had a balanced budget, and yeah, we had a slight surplus. So remember, we started fighting wars we didn't pay. We did put through a massive tax cut, which I don't know, I benefited from it, but I didn't know why I wasn't paying for the war. We put through a restricted drug plan, which cost us. We created a department of Homeland Security that cost us. And my taxes went down instead of up. And then, of course, the financial system cost us $8 million, which hurt our income in the government. So we, at times, did have a balanced budget. But like I said, my taxes have gone down. You know, the United States has been great for me. And just for instance, like Social Security, I mean Medicare, I'm all Medicare, but they can charge me more co-pays and stuff because I can afford it. They can charge me more for my prescription drug plan, so people who can't afford it can get theirs at a much more reasonable price. So there's a lot of things we can do to help with our budget, but we stopped paying for things for so long there, and we're going to have to start paying. I agree, we can cut, but we're never going to cut. And uh, we're going to have to get some income to get our budget back going. And it's going to take us a while. I understand. But I will say, I'm not going to grind Medicare for Just so you know that I have a different proposal. And I actually am for Obamacare. Not that I think it's a great plan, but it's better than nothing. And there are good points for Obamacare and such. And I would like to have that argument. I mean, that debate sometimes. But I just wanted to make a few comments about how we got into this mess. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Those are, those are good points. I mean, there have been a whole bunch of factors that have led us to be where, where we are today. And now is the discussion. It's like, well, how do we get out? What, what are some things we can do? And I think you're right. There needs to be some reforms to Medicare. Uh, people, I think, acknowledge that. And mainly, um, I think the income side what I've been focusing on, first and foremost, I think is getting more people back to work, uh, which would help bring in more income. And that's the, another topic here. Why don't you let me, I'll go on Shirley, and then we'll come back around with that, okay? Uh, but, but just so you know, you know, we've got, uh, as he was saying, you know, between 8% and 9% unemployment, and full employment is considered about 4%. So if that has really hurt, because not only has it, the amount of income come in from tax, not as many people paying taxes, uh, that revenue's gone down, but then the use of the government services has increased, so you have more use of Medicaid, more use of unemployment, and things, so it's increased the cost side. So I'll just share briefly a few 30 job related bills, bills that I think would help businesses feel that certainty and so they want to expand and grow. 28 of them are still sitting in the Senate that they haven't voted on, which has been frustrating.
frustrating, but we've worked on trying to reduce the taxes. Uh, we've worked on some of the regulations, like stopping the farm dust uh, regulation that potentially could regulate farm dust. I mean, it's crazy. Um, we've, we've tried to make sure that uh, business owner job creators are able to access capital. Um, and we've worked towards trying to help energy costs go down so businesses um, have a lower energy cost and hire more people and uh, get more drilling here in America. So we're trying to hit it from all sides to remove the barriers that businesses and companies have to be able to hire, and expand, and grow, and to keep them from going to other countries. Um, then on a practical basis, I've been I've trying to do a couple of things to help jobs. One, we had a business conference in Warrensburg at UCM last September, and I was really excited. We had over 300 people there. These were entrepreneurs, small business owners, um, at home businesses, and they heard we had different panels that discussed with them how to market your, your business, how to grow your business, how to get capital, whatever. So we were trying to be practical and help the job creators grow their business. And then um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a jobs fair down in Lebanon. And that was really fun. We ended up having 29 different companies come and we asked them that day, how many people would you hire today or could you hire if you met the right person? And collectively, there was over 200 jobs there available. So first of all, I was encouraged that they were hiring or wanting to hire. And we had 100 people come and um, uh, they went around and met and, and it's been really exciting. We've heard of some people that got hired that day. So on a very practical basis, we wanted to help match job seekers with job creators, and, and we got some people working now that weren't before. So I'm trying to do everything we can to, to get that. And the last hot topic we want to talk about is the gas prices. And Eric, so I thought that was a funny, you know, we got gas prices, we got the arm, we got the leg, we're your first floor, you know, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad right now. Yes, sir. I would like for you to find out why we are exporting more petroleum products today than we have in the last 60 years, and I'm getting ready to pay $4 for gas. Well, that is a good question, and I'm gonna, I will find out. It's something I've been wanting to find out myself. I hear that charge, uh, yet you also hear that it's supply and demand, and I'm very much for that we need to drill more here, we need to use the energy we're blessed with, the coal, the natural gas, the, the oil, and, and I think that would help. Part of my understanding of what some of our the prices are is that it's a global market, and a lot of it is the uncertainty of what's going to happen in the Middle East, and I think that's just another reason for us to be more energy independent here in our own country, because when you have Iran over there talking about going to war against Israel or, and, and uh, blocking off the Strait of Hormuz, that causes the market to go up because they think, oh boy, our supply is going to be cut off, and and so we got problems there. So we got a doubling of gas prices here, uh, and Missouri's average now 374. But I, I don't know specifically on the export tax, so I'll have to find out. And make sure you get your name afterwards. Yes, in the back row, you haven't had a chance to talk yet, and then we'll come back. Yeah, Jim Ellis, uh, Pettis County. How do you and other House Republicans justify continuing tax break of five million per year for oil companies when they had combined profits of 170 billion in 2011? Is this possibly a payback to special? Well, first of all, I've never gotten any money from any oil companies, so it doesn't affect me that, that question, that last implication, that have anything to do with that. Um, I looked at that when I first got into office because um, uh, people were talking about all the tax breaks that oil people get, and I'm like, what are they? I mean, because I didn't know. I mean, like I said, I'm a farmer from Archie and a small business owner and a teacher, and I, I didn't know. So my staff researched it and, and put that uh, together, a sheet with me on what they get. And what I found is that the majority of them, that people cite this number that oil companies have, the majority aren't specific just to them. They are tax credits or deductions that go to all manufacturing sector. So, for instance, depreciation of new equipment, 
That's something that every manufacturer gets. And yes, oil companies get that too if they buy some new drilling equipment, they get to depreciate it. But it's, it, those numbers are a little bit uh, skewed, I think. But there was a few specific just to them, and so you can look at that and say, should we get rid of them? And I think some of them probably, you know, we should. The one of them, for instance, is that they get a tax credit if they're willing to drill in a hard-to-drill-in area. So if they go to a new area where the oil is, doesn't easily come out, it's an incentive for them to drill there and they get a tax credit for it. But we could, we could do that away with that, I think. I mean, leave it up to the private sector, um, you know, supply and demand. And if you want to drill there, fine. And if you don't, you know, maybe you should get a tax credit. So, I think we are looking at that. Part of the Paul Ryan budget does it get rid of some of the loopholes and, and tax breaks and things. But bottom line, the implication is from sometimes you hear from Washington is that these tax, these oil companies should be making so much money and we need to tax them. I'm just thinking practically here. If you tax an oil company more, how is that going to lower my gas price? It may feel good, you know, these big oil, let's tax them. But I'm concerned, and I want to see the price go down the pump, you know, on a practical basis. So I, I try to look at everything and step back and just do some common sense farm girl from Archie thing and say, okay, is this going to help us lower the gas price or not? And uh, so anyway, that's kind of a matrix I look through things. But uh, we are looking at some of those loopholes, and I think you'll see some of them close. Yes, sir. Uh. <clears throat> Obamacare is against the Constitution. Anytime you tell somebody that they have to buy, and I'm talking about health care, that is against the Constitution. That is why the Supreme Court is going over it now. And George Bush, when he was president and the price of gas was shooting up, he threatened to drill off the coast and he was going to. The price of gas went down. So Obama took the office, the price of gas here was $1.84 down. Yeah. This man does not threaten business. We, we have oil in Alaska, Manwar, basically the most, if not, it's probably not all, but the vast majority of the drilling in this country is on private land because this man and his associates does not like oil, does not like the free market, does not like the Constitution. And if the Supreme Court throws this out, which I think they will, he's just going to turn his head to it and he's going to do it anyway. Because he did the same damn thing with the drilling off the coast. He don't care. I, I think a lot of, I agree with a lot of your, your comments. I, I do believe that the health care law is unconstitutional. We'll see what they say. Uh, but you're right. I've never before has Congress stipulated to its citizens that you have to buy a private product. And if you don't, you're going to be penalized. And, you know, and then go further and even stipulates what's in that private product. So if that is found constitutional, what else could Congress tell you you have to do? What other good idea? Congress, you have to buy life insurance. You have to buy an energy efficient car. You have, I mean, on and on. So I agree with you. We'll see what the Supreme Court says. But uh, yeah, I have a lot of concerns with that. And I do agree, too, that we need to be drilling here and using the oils. And you're right. The increase in oil production has come mainly from private lands. The amount from federal lands has decreased because of the president's uh, administration stopping the permitting there uh, and, and or making it uh, hard to drill there through moratoriums or withholding the leases and things. So uh, we are the Saudi Arabia of the world in coal and in oil and in natural gas. Let's use the resources we've been blessed with. I don't like being energy dependent on foreign countries, especially ones that don't like us. And so we can do more. And I'll say too, I believe in all the above energy policy. I think we should be doing nuclear. Nuclear is safe. You can do it safely. Uh, and renewable fuels and, and solar and wind are maybe part of the solution. But I think uh, most of the solution probably needs to be a petroleum based. And it can be done safely and cleanly. So, so I thought, yes, sir. 
By the way, this is Steve Walsh, my communications director. Thank you, Steve, for running around with the microphone. Appreciate it. My name is Bill Clay. I live on a farm out of Houston. First of all, the beautiful Pest County. Thank See you. you. Uh, I spent a number of years in the bank regulation field. I was a federal examiner as well as a state examiner. Uh, and I believe in regulation. It's essential, especially for the national industry. I have said, I have written, that I think a lot of the problems of the national industry, 2007 2008, date right to November 1999, when Congress repealed the Glass Steagall Act. Came exactly 1933 years ago, which separated the banking, commercial banking, investment banking, from insurance industry. Your opinion, please, on the regulation, the regulation of the national industry in general, or the re regulation of the industry? Uh, what's your sure, Bill, and you would have first hand uh, knowledge of that. No, I, I agree. I don't think they should have done that, and that was started with, with the problem as well as the Community Reinvestment Act, which forces banks to uh, lend to people who didn't necessarily have the collateral or, or the capability of paying back the loan. And uh, so those are some issues that need to be reversed. Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the Dodd-Frank bill, uh, because that's the financial, large financial bill that was passed before I got there. But I think it was intended to go after the big banks who were deemed uh, or viewed as being part of the problem with the, the big problem we had in 2008 financially. Um, but yet, from all the community banks that I talked to in the fourth, we talked about the thousands and thousands of pages of regulations that are coming out from that bill that's actually hurting the small banks, and they were the ones doing the things right because they knew their customers, they know you, they're the local hometown bank, you know that lender, and he knows if you have the capability to pay or not, they can't comply with. They don't have full-time regulators on their staff to help pay for that. So that's the feedback I'm hearing for the community banks. I, I didn't know if you were, if you're still involved in regulate or not, but what you think of the Dodd-Frank bill, are you hearing similar concerns about it? And most bankers do say they believe we need to have some regulation banks. Uh, obviously, but we don't, this over-regulation is what they're concerned about in the Dodd-Frank. Are you still involved with that? Well, I was at Bank as well, then, several years ago, so I'm okay. out of the, yeah. on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Yes, hi. One of the things that's happening as part of the banking regulation that affects everybody is one of the uh, small things. Every year, children's birthdays, I would go in and buy an eyeball for their birthday. I went into the bank here a week ago, buy them through the bank. You have to go online, you have to have a computer, you have to go to a website. Yes, no paper bonds issued. And I thought, for crying out loud, bank took care of me, I'm into the, the market system now, something completely different. U.S. Treasury is not going to get my money. They will some. But not. And I thought, now how many grandparents out there buy $25 bonds from there? You can't do it anymore. Wow. Frank, I had not heard that. He says you can't get a paper bond for your grandkids at the bank anymore. That's sad. That is really sad. So a couple of the other crazy uh, regulations with the banks I've heard about is, well, not crazy, but you require the 20% down now before you can buy a house. And um, that's just maybe overkill. I mean, the pendulum is swept too far because that's going to preclude a lot of you from being able to buy a home 20% down. They also weren't allowing other people, they were requiring banks to call a loan not good if somebody else made the payment for them. So, say a, a young couple is having a little trouble making ends meet, and uh, the mom's and the dad's able to, they say, We'll make your payment this month to help you get through to get a job or whatever. And the government is telling the bank that you can't accept that or you have to deem that loan is not good, even though it's current. So, you know, so there's just some things like that I think maybe uh, don't make sense. And the federal government needs to kind of be away. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. Oh, one more. Yes, sir. Uh, well, the okay. budget, cutting everything, and so forth. For the last <clears throat> approximately year and a half, the uh, started out with uh, White Air Force Base wanting to acquire land. 
They've got Russian women on the ground they've already got. Uh, now, they turned that into to the Department of Defense. Now the Corps of Engineers are involved. Uh, we've contacted your office and wonder what your answer to this is and why they want to take prime farmland that if you're in the farming business, you have to have land. Land is not available that you can't buy. You already buy this option. You are farming it. You are making a living as a small farmer. Why is it? And, and here, we're short, we're short on money to keep buying it. Budgets way over things. Here, they're willing. Where do they get this money to do this for stuff that they don't even need? And, and put it under perspective. Uh, say you're a carpenter and the government comes along and takes all your salts. How are you going to call, how are you going to keep the business? How uh, if you're uh, a plumber, you lose half of your pipe wrenches. You lose all your pipe wrenches. A mechanic, you lose all of your half of your tools. You are no longer in business. If we lose this ground, we're no longer in farming business. Because you have to, your farmer, a farm girl, you know, you have to have volume. So where do you stand on this as far as them trying to acquire this land that they don't even need and don't have the money to spend for it? You bet. Uh, I'll, I'll have to give it to my office to see who you talk to about this specifically because I wasn't, I, I'm not familiar with your particular case. And I need to look into it. The only thing I know is when I the first time went over to Whiteman Air Force Base, they did show me a map and said that we're trying to expand into into new areas. That's about the extent of the uh, the issue that I have been aware of. That they just wanted to get more land. And all they said, if I remember right, is just you know for looking into the future, they wanted to make sure that they they keep. Uh, have all the assets that they need for any expansion or growth that they be called on to do. Of course, they're the home of, you know, the B-2 bomber, the only one in the world. And uh, they want to make sure that they have enough land to expand or do whatever they need to do. But other than that, I don't know. But I'd be happy to, to look into that. And I can appreciate the heartburn that's causing you if that's your land and you're not wanting to sell. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I will be happy to look into that. So thank you. Well, they said, you got to go? Gotta well, go? let's do one more. Let's do one, one more. Question. Who hasn't asked a question yet? Somebody else, you know, somebody new, right here. And I'm sorry I'm not able to stay longer. We've got four town halls today, and I'm trying to meet as many people as I can in the 4th District while I'm here this week. Yes? Jim Sergeant Eric Sager, retired Army, 38 years. Uh, that question, that I want to first say, I appreciate your help with the Armed Services Committee. Military, and I was wanting to know one question. I want to have a question answered. What do you think about Obama's birth certificate being called? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I think about Obama's birth certificate being a forgery. Um, you know, I have a lot of doubts about all that, but I don't know. I haven't seen it. I'm kind of, I'm just the same place you are on that, and then you read this, you read that, but I don't understand why he didn't show that by the way. I mean, if somebody asked me my birth certificate, I'd go to my baby book and get it out and say, here it is. So I don't know, but but they say that it's real and... Everybody here had to go in and get their driver's license and to show their original birth certificate. Sheriff Joe Ovey was a posse down in Maricopa County, Arizona, that made a determination that both birth certificates and his select service cards are forgeries. I think the main thing we can do whether you agree or not, I, I mean, I don't think that's the real issue. The real issue is this November. There's a, there's some called an election. And, you know, you could sue and go to court and try to get an approved business or that. Or I think the main thing is just if, if you like him, get out and vote for him in November. And if you don't like him, don't vote for him. You know, that's why, as Americans, we have. So that's probably the quickest way we can uh, settle this. But. Or to defend the Constitution. Uh, enemies from foreign and domestic have been taken over domestic. Well, and I, the media is the system. Yeah. Well, 